Pennsylvania still without a full state budget. What has to happen to finally get it done? We hear one side of the argument coming up next on For the Record. Commonwealth's attorneys and I have concluded that the NCAA sanctions were overreaching and unlawful. Someone's got to develop a product that you and I as a consumer are going to want to buy. The country needs a comprehensive energy. Good morning and welcome to this edition of For the Record. Time to talk the Pennsylvania budget situation. And to do that, we bring in State Representative Kerry Benninghoff. Mr. Benninghoff, thank you very much for being here. Appreciate you having us. Get right into it. The problem with the state budget, as everybody's going, we're now in 2016, so don't have a full budget passed for the last year. I, I think that's an accurate way to say it. The general appropriations bill was passed in the end of December. As you know, we've put two budgets on the governor's desk put several emergency funding proposals forward, which he's chosen to either completely veto or blue line. Blue lining is basically scratching out areas that he does not want to fund. Keep in mind that the uh, Treasury basically certified that the Commonwealth had $29.8 billion in the budget. When the governor blue lined the last general appropriations bill specific items, it was about $24 billion uh, that was spent. So there's about six, $6.2 billion still there. And we are trying to encourage that release uh, in these remaining months. Now, if we go back to June, the, from what I understood, the Republicans wanted to go through the initial budget of a line veto and go through it with the governor. Governor Wolf said, no, absolutely not, not doing it. Then, after a couple of Republican budgets were passed out of the Senate, he said, let's go through it. The Republican Senate said, no, we don't want to do that. Isn't it a little bit on both sides that it's taken this long to actually get this done? Well, the reality is there was a budget given to the governor before our statutory date of June 30th. Mm -hmm. uh, it was $30.3 billion. Uh, the governor did not feel that was enough. He had some other requests. As you know, his original ask was for about $33.8 billion, which is about a $4 billion increase over last year's budget. Both Republicans and Democrats were not in favor of that. If you remember, historically, we did bring that budget to the floor. I think it's important from a parliamentary perspective a governor cannot introduce a piece of legislation. A member of the General Assembly, either in the House or Senate, have to do that. Uh, the Democrats actually were not even willing to introduce the governor's bill. It was one of our Republican members who introduced the governor's $33.8 billion budget on the House floor for debate and discussion. And subsequently, when the vote was called, the bill got zero votes. Yep. No Democrats, no Republicans. And I think that's pretty self-diagnostic. So if you cannot get that, then you have to go to the area where you can. And that's where we arrived at a $30.3 billion budget, which adequately funded all the areas of the budget we funded the year before. Over 272 of the 401 items were funded at the same level the governor wanted, if not higher. With higher education, locally Penn State, getting a 5% increase at a time where Social Security recipients were getting a 0% increase. I think that's a res responsible and a reasonable budget. He blue line, pardon me, that one he vetoed in, in its entirety. So this impasse could have been prevented and people could have had their money in the beginning of July. You mentioned bringing the budget to the floor. December 15th, I think, uh, my date might not be exact on Pretty that, close. but mid-December, mid, mid there was a Senate compromise. I believe it passed in the Senate 31 to 19. Mm -hmm. From what I understand from some people in the room, that there was an agreement that it was going to be brought to the floor in the House, and Representative Torzai said, yes, I was going to bring it. I'm not going to help you get the votes, but I'll bring it. After it got passed in the Senate, it didn't get to the floor. I got to think that for the Republicans that would have backed that, especially in the Senate, that looks very bad on them. Well, it's not necessarily to make them look bad, but the reality is, though the Speaker and other members of the top tier of the leadership team may have had some gentleman's agreement on something that's called the framework, the governor continues to talk about the framework, you have to look at it in its entirety. That framework also include doing significant reform of the pension system, the largest cost driver of state government. Mm -hmm. We're putting $600 million more million in this year's budget, $1.3 billion more in next year's budget to address this issue. It's also the number one cost driver of all your school districts. That was one of the legs of the four-legged stool for the framework. Privatization of liquor stores, it's some that's philosophical. For me, I just think the government shouldn't be in the alcohol business. We shouldn't be the buyer, producer, pricer, and distributor, and the police agency. That was the second leg of the stool. 
Representative Reed, the majority leader, he wanted property tax reform, had a significant proposal passed out of the House, and that was the third leg of the stool. And the other part was the governor's desire to raise PIT, personal income tax, or your paycheck tax, and raise the sales tax. Well, the reality is when it got over to us, the uh, there were not enough votes. The pension bill went down. It only garnished 52 of us who voted in support of it. The private legislation bill went down. There's two legs of stool. The property tax bill did not get passed in the Senate. So you can't have a four-legged stool with one stool, and the governor can't get just the tax increases when the rest of the framework had failed. So at that point, we had to go to an alternative and gave him the $30.2 billion budget. On its face, without those changes, would you have been in favor of the bill if it made it to the floor in the House? No, because it was $600 million more million of spending. Okay. It was just outrageous at a time when people's paychecks are not increasing that point, and I thought it was too much. And that was, uh, sadly, what the majority of our members felt as well. And so, therefore, you can bring a bill up, but you got to have the votes to pass it. you got to have 102 votes in the House and 26 in the Senate. We'll talk more about the pension a little bit later. The school tax, I know on your website you, ha you have said that 34% of this school additional spending is going to go to one school district in southeastern Pennsylvania, which we all presume to be Philadelphia County. 24% yeah, would have gone to one school district that represents 12% of the entire school population. I think that's very disproportionate. I'm going to ask to take more money out of your paycheck. I'm going to ask you to pay a sales tax of 7% uh, at items such as uh, health care costs or home nursing or you go to an attorney to get a will drafted up. All those things would now be taxed at 7% when they were not taxed at all in order to send a majority of that money to another school district and not necessarily benefit your own area. I think that's very difficult and it's a battle we have, unfortunately, with rural versus urban parts of the Commonwealth. We in the rural areas generally have less business, less industry. We have less representation and in the urban areas they have high density of population, they have a lot of representatives and senators and they oftentimes can carry the day with the votes. We're going to talk more about that a little bit later because I specifically want to get into maybe where would a healthy compromise be saying that if most of that money actually stayed local and some of the tax maybe was cut in half to a 3.5 percent and seven. We'll get your thoughts on that a little bit later. We're talking to Pennsylvania State Budget with State Representative Carrie Benninghoff. Talking the Pennsylvania State Budget here on For the Record with State Representative Carrie Benninghoff. Representative Bettinghoff, we left off talking about some of the school tax and how so much of the education funding that's proposed, so much of it is going to go to southeastern Pennsylvania, specifically Philadelphia School District. I believe you said the tax rate would have been 7% to come up with those funds for things that aren't currently taxed. Where would a compromise be, say, is it maybe at 2%, is it maybe at 3%, is there a red line drawn that it's going to be 0%, and how much of that money actually has to stay, say, with the Bald Eagle areas, with the State College Area School District, instead of getting shipped out of the area? Well, on a global perspective, in rural Pennsylvania, we always struggle that we get the same amount of taxation, but sometimes we don't get the same kind of revenue that comes back here. And we get frustrated that the urban areas seem to get the lion's share of any new funding, whether it's for education or any other program in the Commonwealth. You know, historically, the bulk of our funding goes to the two urban areas of Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, and in the present proposal that the governor had, a, a lion's share of the money did go to Philadelphia while raising the sales tax here on local people to 7 percent. Uh, Pittsburgh would have went to 8 and Philly would have went to 9 percent. Uh, that's pretty significant increases and the fact that tax is basically what they call cradle to grave from diapers to daycare to home nursing to funeral services. Uh, that's a big policy change and that was not all going to property taxes. I personally thought the property tax proposal should have been bifurcated from the budget. I thought we need to get the budget done first and get that passed. The property tax issue has never been a simple one to solve. Uh, there is no magic formula to completely eliminate property taxes. And we find a lot of Pennsylvanians live somewhere else and work somewhere else and they move back to Pennsylvania because the retirement is not taxed. And that's a great asset for them but it makes it very difficult when you're the third largest aging state that the majority of population is starting to get in the sector where they're not paying any other tax other than property taxes. So they feel the burden of the property taxes, but they aren't paying anything through the personal income tax. 
it puts a tremendous burden on the working people. So you get this class warfare between those that are currently working, those who are retired, those who don't want to be paying for school anymore because they don't have children in the school, and those that have young families trying to just get a start. So it's not a simple solution. There's not one particular tax uh, that I believe, I think it's a menu of taxes that's going to work best there. Is that something that maybe we're going to look down the road that's going to happen that maybe those retirement funds are going to be taxed in the state of Pennsylvania? I don't necessarily think that's going to happen. That's a pretty politically volatile thing. You see what's happening right now, just trying to reform the current pension system, even though all retirees would be excluded out of that. I don't see Pennsylvania going to a system where they would tax total income. I believe the last time you were on a program, last January, I believe, we talked about the pension re reform yes. and how that was going to be a big sticking point, uh, has been a big sticking point for maybe the last two years in the state of Pennsylvania. Would, could you actually point to that as saying that was the key cog besides education of why the budget deal wasn't fully completed? Well, the Senate was very adamant since January 1 that no pension reform, nothing else is also going to be moving. They, they see the significance of a cost driving problem that is not only for us in the Commonwealth level, but also in the local school districts. And they feel very strongly, and I think many of our House members do as well, that we cannot ignore this. This issue has continued to be ignored. There's a $60 billion liability. As you know, the fund lost 30 to $40 billion in 2001, an economic downturn of 2008. That's a significant loss. And you get all these local wrangling over, well, the state didn't put enough money in, the school districts didn't put enough money in. I'm not in for the blame game. At this point, uh, regardless of who put enough money in, we would have lost that in the market crash as well. It's about how do you stabilize it so people can earn a decent retirement upon their retirement and that fund's going to be stable in order to fulfill those requirements. Basic changes were looking at future employees. It was not going to affect current retirees. They would have been safe. Uh, but a lot of the organized labor organizations wanted to block it and stop it. Where they blocked the liquor bill with the idea if you block the liquor bill, it knocks out the pension bill. If you block the net pension bill, it knocks out the liquor bill, and therefore the framework fell apart. Where's the line drawn? Because I've always said that, and, and, and I do agree with you, it, you can't affect the current retirees because they're at the mercy because they're already done. Right. But maybe somebody who's under five years in, in the gut, is that maybe the line? Is the magic number 10 years? Is, is it seven years? Wh where's, the, where's the target that that line has to be drawn? Well, the reality in that proposal is anything you had paid into it, whether you're in the system for five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years, was safe. And you know, the current DB process says if you put this much fund money, the Commonwealth will match that. That was safe. Your future years, whether one or five years, you would have had the option to go into a hybrid proposal. Uh, in the House, we actually made that option available to anyone that's in the current state system, whether it's Penn State employees, Penn Dot employees, uh, other government employees, that you could have made that choice. And there are people, such as yourself, young in your career, that you want that flexibility because it, when you allow them to go into a defined contribution system, it makes that portable. So if you leave somewhere else that has a similar type of system, you can take that with you. Otherwise, you leave state employment, your thing's frozen, and you have no control over managing that. There are many people who work in state government who do not have the state defined benefit program because they want to manage their own retirement. They choose to not have that taken out of their paycheck. They take the money individually and they invest it otherwise. So the compromise was giving security to retirees, taking care of those current employees, but future hires would know upon retirement you're going to be in a hybrid system or you would be in a defined contribution, much like a 401k. But it gave them, gave them that portability. I tell a lot of young people, the average person is going to change jobs five to seven times in your career path. You may have a degree in this one field, but you're probably not going to get a job and stay in it for 30 or 35 years like many of our previous generations did. That portability with your retirement is very important to a lot of younger generation people who want to be able to manage their money. That was the significance of the overall change, at the same time making a stable system that could sustain itself. Two feel that anytime soon that that's actually going to happen like the, the pension reform does finally get passed because how long have we been talking about it At minimum two years here pro possibly upwards of four i'm concerned that we probably missed the greatest window to do that and some of the leverage was off on that i'm not convinced that this administration is as enthusiastic about doing something about now i think they've been lobbied very hard to oppose it and not let that happen and i think there you know there may be 
uh, not seeing the, the significance of the economic impact in the long run. You know, they want they pick up this idea. You just got to let this thing kind of ride out for another year or two and see how it does. Talking the Pennsylvania state budget with State Representative Kerry Benninghoff. Stay with us. You are watching WHVL's For the Record. Here on WHVL's For the Record, we are with State Representative Kerry Benninghoff talking the Pennsylvania state budget because we're talking state politics and what else is there to talk about in Pennsylvania right now. Representative, we left off talking a little bit about the pension reform. At the same time, I did want to swing the conversation into the primary season that, that's coming up. April right. 26th is the primary. It's, is that going to have an effect on eventually getting the full budget passed and then working ahead to next year because we already have next year's budget already proposed? Well, we are currently trying to introduce proposals. We did several last week to get what we call supplementals passed. Uh, to expend out that other six billion dollars of the budget or portions of that to burn centers, uh, local uh, child advocacy centers, to get that money flowing. Uh, while it may be a piecemeal way of getting the budget done, I believe that we can wrap this thing up and be done with it, but we've got to have the will to get the votes. Unfortunately, as I said to you earlier, we do not have bipartisan support for some of these things. Uh, I'm amazed at some of the members that are voting against uh, corrections funding voting against, as I said, child advocacy centers where people take their child if they think they've been molested or, or, or treated improperly sexually to be the centralized place where they're evaluated. How can you vote against that funding? That's not Republican or Democrat. But we can do that in this budget. And as you know, we've started into the new budget already. I feel like just from our conversation here today that you have a sense of urgency about getting this done. I've talked to a couple other representatives over the phone. I felt like they had an urgency to get it done. At the same time, reading the statewide papers, I see maybe higher ranking officials that really don't have that sense of urgency. How frustrating is that to see that? Uh, very frustrating for two reasons. One, you the taxpayers already paid the money. The money's sitting in the treasury. I think it's irresponsible to not release that money. And I think number two, it's very paramount in some of these agencies who are looking at having to lay people off and or downsize the services they provide. We're talking about 13% of the overall budget that needs to be disseminated. 88% of the money's flowing. I've called our county, I've called local agencies, they've gotten their money. It's just these smaller organizations that are being held hostage. Organizations like Epilepsy Foundation, uh, Sickle Cell Anemia, Lupus, organizations who operate on less than a half a million dollar budget, they get $100,000 from the Commonwealth. That's a significant part of your budget. When do we start to focus and say, let's forget about passing the last 12%, let's start working on next year's 100%, so we're going to pass a budget of 112%. When, and and that, those are just the, not the actual numbers, I'm just doing basic arithmetic right there. Well, I don't know if it'll be done as a co combination. We are already going to be starting budget talks. The governor gave, well, laid out the paperwork for his budget, didn't really give a, a traditional type of dress. And so our hearings will start by the Appropriation Committee, having people come in and justify the amount of money that they're going to get. I think we can work in tandem with that. As I said, I think we'll end the 2015-16 budget by doing some supplementals while every single dollar gets expended. You know, and to me, there's probably areas there we don't have to expend all that money, and that could be money used to address the structural deficit that so many people talk about going into next year's budget. So it's about keen budgeting, being smart about the money. I mean, one of the areas he cut was us. And we can survive without that, and I've told my leadership I'm willing to do that, and I think we need to do that, lead by example. There's some other areas in the budget we may not just completely backfill entirely, move into next year's budget and get moving. Under five, let's swing it into Penn State, Pitt, Lincoln, mm -hmm. Temple a little bit. Obviously, big to do with the UPUA of, of Penn State sending a letter to Governor Wolf. Off camera, we talked a little bit about a recent letter from Secretary Hanger uh, to... I don't want to use the word threatening the trustees at Penn State, but about the lobbying and Penn State going back and forth. Now, on one point, I view that that letter is inappropriate. At the same point, I look at a lot of the governor's structure that is at Penn State and the Board of Trustees, and I don't trust the Penn State Board of Trustees. And this is something that I have for four years ago. So I, at some point, I view that as it's good that he's involved. At the same time, he wants to, Governor Wolf wants to increase the educational spending at, the, at Penn State and other main universities. Can you trust these people in ivory towers at universities that actually spend money in the correct way? I think you have to look first at the initial part of your comment. 
you're having a governor's cabinet sending what was perceived as a threatening letter. If you're going to get any money from us, you need to lobby the legislature and tell them to raise taxes. That's unprecedented. We've never seen a governor do those types of things. That's just not good public policy as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we had a budget and we had line items set for Penn State and the other four state relays, given a significant 5% increase in a tough economy. Lincoln University, another state relay, was going to get seven. They're in very tough, dire states. We were very generous in our appropriations. Uh, we brought it up for a vote in the House, and unfortunately only the Republicans voted for it, and that's a bill that needs two-thirds majority of the votes. So the, the significance of your question is, is that proper procedure for a governor to tell trustees of any campus to become lobbyists to tell the legislature to raise taxes? We think that's inappropriate. Uh, you know, campuses make their decisions. They elect a board to disseminate the money. Penn State has a significant enrollment. Uh, they have far more requests than they have spots to put them in. A, you know, it's a consumer demand type of thing. If people didn't think they were getting a bang for their buck, they wouldn't have the have thousand. I think they had 100,000 applications a year mm -hmm. for, what, less than 30,000 openings campus-wide. So I don't look at Penn State's budget. I don't know how they manage their money. Uh, there's a separate agency with does a lot of the athletics. It's somewhat separate from their other part of their budget. Um, I don't manage that. Does, does the state need to look into how Penn State's actually spending the money? Because Penn State's spending tens of millions of dollars right now building uh, dorm rooms in, in urban-type branch campuses where there's housing available. Is that wise that they're spending that type of money? Realizing that only a small portion of their funding does come from the state, but does the state have to look in to say, well, how are you spending the money that we're actually giving you? Well, the Commonwealth Governor's Office has five appointees that sit on that board of directors. The rest of the board of directors, uh, for the most part, uh, are elected by, or a bulk of them, are elected by the alumni, people that are part of Penn State Nation. Uh, that is somewhat of a separate board. It is not state-run. And we are in somewhat of a precarious position because they are not a state-owned college. We have a lot more power and insight and input on those types of things. They're considered state-related. They get a small portion, I think this should be $250 million, of their funding comes from us in a multi-billion dollar operation that we don't have say over their governance. They have a charter that dictates those types of things. And this argument of whether and how they use their money and whether we should have more input has been an ongoing thing for years. But the reality is we only have control over the amount of money that we give them which is taxpayer money. The rest they get through private dollars, tuition dollars. Uh, college is expensive all around. Mr. Benninghoff, thank you so much for being yes. here. Should be an uh, interesting co next couple of weeks as we yes. uh, head down here in late February, early March. Well, I'm excited to serve. We've got a lot of good things, and I'm working on something called Pen Save as a way to saving money within government as our new initiative we can talk about later. Thank you very much, and thank you for watching WHBLs for the record.